Potter's house. <laughs> yeah. Woo, good stuff. <laughs> there it is. There it is. Yeah, it's good to be with you. And we're going to take a journey together now. We're going to take a journey to the Potter's house. You know, in the Old Testament, in the book of Jeremiah, in chapter 18, in the first six verses there, it says, this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Uh, go down to the potter's house, and there I'm going to give you my message. And so Jeremiah writes, I went to the potter's house, and I watched him working at his wheel. But the pot he was fashioning from the clay was marred in his hands. And so the potter fashioned it into another pot, as seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel. Can I not do with you as this potter does? Declares the Lord like clay in the hands of the potter. So you are in my hands. And so we see in this passage, God, he sends Jeremiah on a journey to the potter's house. And as Jeremiah is sitting there watching the potter work with the clay, God begins to unfold for Jeremiah a deeper understanding into how God works in the lives of his people. It really is a lot like a potter working with their clay. Did you know that the Bible makes reference in several places to God's relationship to his people as being similar to the relationship that a potter has to their clay? Did you know that? If we look in the earliest pages of Scripture in the book of Genesis, in chapter 2, part of the creation account, there in verse 7, it says, And then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into man the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now, we know that the book of Genesis is originally written in the Hebrew language. And the Hebrew word that is used for formed here in verse 7, that God formed man, that Hebrew word is yatsar. And it literally means to form. But as a potter, what I think is kind of neat is that the, the Hebrew root word from which yatsar comes from is yotzer. And yotzer, it literally means a potter, somebody who works with clay. And so a more literal translation of Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 would read, and then the Lord God did the work of a potter and formed man from the dust of the ground. Isn't that cool church? Come on. That's cool. Yeah. Oh, that's good. That's good. And so, and so we see right here in this Genesis passage from God's very first contact with his human creation. It is in the context of a relationship between a potter and their clay. Well, with this understanding, what I want to do is I want to take you through some of the processes a potter takes their clay through as they fashion their clay into a piece of earthenware. And as I do, I want to talk to you about some of the similar processes God allows us to go through as he's fashioning our lives into what the Bible refers to in 2 Timothy 2.21 as vessels of honor fit for the master's use. Now, I'm going to be doing several illustrations for you this evening with these pieces of clay up here. And, of course, this clay is a metaphor for our life. And so I want you to see your life represented in these different pieces of clay. Now, when a potter is going to make something on their wheel, uh, the first thing they have to do is they have to, they have to go out and dig up some clay. Now, when a potter goes out looking for their clay, do you know where they look for it? They look for it in the swamp. <laughs> they look for it in the wetlands. Now, when a potter goes out looking for their clay, they're not looking for clay that's going to be perfect. It's got to be just perfect. And do you know why the potter doesn't go out looking for perfect clay? Because the potter knows there is no such thing as perfect clay. Yeah, the potter knows that when they dig this clay up out of the swamp, it's going to have all sorts of muck and all sorts of mire and all sorts of junk inside of it. And the potter understands that dealing with all that junk that's inside the clay, that's just all perfect part of the formation process. Now, I want to start with this point because I talk to a lot of people and sometimes people will tell me they want to have a relationship with God or they want to go deeper in their relationship with God, but they don't feel they can do that now, see, because they just don't feel good enough. See, they're still struggling with some junk in their life. Maybe they're struggling with an addiction. Maybe they got a habit they can't control. Maybe they got some people in their life that they know are not good for them. And they just don't feel good enough to have a relationship with the Lord. But listen, friends, the Bible makes it really clear. None of us are good enough in and of ourselves. Right? Come on. It, yeah, it says in Romans chapter 3. Amen. Come on. It says in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, that there is nobody who's righteous, not even one person. It says in verse 23 of that same chapter that we have all sinned. 
Come on, church. It says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This is the whole reason why God sends Jesus into the world to, to die for our sins so we can be reconciled to God. Because in and of ourselves, we're just not good enough. But the good news of the gospel is that God is not looking for you to be good enough before you can have a relationship with him. No, friend, he's just looking for you to be willing. That's all. You just be willing to open your heart. Ask Jesus Christ to come into you. Give God a chance. Just give him a chance and he's going to take you just the way you are because he understands that dealing with all that junk that's in your life, <laughs> that's just all part of the formation process. Yeah, come on. Now, what's the potter has their clay? They, they can't just take it and put it on their wheel and start working with it. It's not going to work. <clears throat> See, the potter knows if this clay is going to be successful on the wheel, this clay has got to first be properly prepared for the wheel. Now, this process of preparing the clay, potters call it the wedging process, and it accomplishes three objectives. And I'm going to go over those with you now as we get started. Now, in order to understand the first objective in preparing this clay, you have to understand something about the structure of clay. Clay is made up of platelets of felspartic rock. That's all it is. Now, when the clay is first dug up out of the earth, all the platelets that make up this piece of clay, these platelets are facing in all different directions. Now, in order for this clay to be moldable when it's on the wheel, and in order for this clay to have the strength it's going to need to have to stand up under the stress and the pressure I'm going to be putting it under when it's on the wheel, all of these platelets, they all have to be oriented in the same direction. I call it being oriented in the potter's direction. That is in the direction the potter wants the clay to go. And that's the first objective in preparing this clay. You've got to get it all oriented in the potter's direction. Now, the way this process looks is you, you just put your clay on your work surface and you, you push down on it and you squish it. And then you push it forward because you're trying to stretch it. And then you roll it back on itself and you, you drive it down into itself and through itself. And you're going to continue this process of pushing and stretching and rolling and twisting. You're going to continue this process until this clay has been prepared. Now, I want you to notice what's starting to happen to this clay as I'm beginning to work with it. Uh, notice it's changing shape. It's, it's taking on the shape of a cone. See, it's narrow at one end. It has some folds in it here. And notice if you can see it, it's starting to develop a counterclockwise spiral to it. And you can see the spiral taking place right here in the wide part of the clay. This is the direction I'm orienting the clay. I'm going to rework the whole structure of this clay and get it all oriented in this counterclockwise direction. Okay, why am I doing this? I'm doing this because I have my wheel set up to spin in a counterclockwise direction. So what's going to happen is I'm going to rework this clay. I'm going to get it all oriented in this counterclockwise direction. And then I'm going to pick it up and put it onto the wheel. And look, look. It's going to continue to spin in a counterclockwise direction. Now, what would happen if the clay was oriented to the right, but the wheel was spinning to the left? What would happen if the clay and the potter were not both moving in the same direction? Yeah, what would happen is I'd only be able to take this clay so far. I'd only be able to take it so far in its formation, and then it wouldn't be able to handle the stress, the pressure I'm putting it under as I'm trying to take it further, and it'd fall apart right on the wheel. So the first objective in preparing this clay is we've got to get it all oriented in this counterclockwise direction. Now, as you're watching me do this, I have a question for you, and I want you to call the answer out loud. Now, I know some of you have seen this already, so you can't call that answer out, because that'd be cheating, and the Lord will get you for that. So... So here's my question, all right? Uh, <clears throat> what's the primary thing you see me using here? What am I using to move this clay in the direction I need it to be going? What am I using, class? Yeah, they had pressure. Some of you said hands and some of you said pressure. Yeah, I'm, I'm using pressure. The pressure fi is finding its expression through my hands. But did you know pressure, it can find its expression through lots of different things, can't it? Pressure finds expression through things like financial difficulties, through challenges in relationships through stresses in marriage, through anxieties around parenting, through peer pressure, school pressure, employment issues, health concerns. Pressure finds its expression through lots of different things, 
in this case, it's finding it through my hands. You see, this is a very physical process. I'm, I'm pushing down on the clay. I'm stretching and rolling and twisting it. This is a painful process for this clay. I'm heaping affliction onto this clay right here. This is a really painful process for this clay. And think about this. If this clay could talk to me as I'm taking it through this process, what do you think this clay would be saying to me right about now? Yeah, that's what he's saying. Oh, Potter, stop. That hurts me. Why are you doing this to me? I'm, I'm so confused. I didn't ask for this. Why, I thought you loved me. Hey, come on. Now, if you were really a loving Potter, you wouldn't be letting this happen to me. That's what it would be saying because this is a really painful process for the clay. But if I, as the Potter, if I could talk to this clay in a way that the clay could understand me, do you know what I would say to this clay in response to its cries of pain and protest? I would say, I would say, clay, I know the plans I have for you. Yeah, plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Yeah, plans to give you hope in the future. And so I continue. And so the potter uses pressure to move the clay in the direction he needs it to go. Now, when I think about our life, is there anything, is there anything that can get your attention and orient you toward God more effectively than pressure. Come on, I see it all the time in the lives of people. They're too busy for God. They don't have time for God. They don't have time to pray. They don't have time to read their Bible or have a devotional. They don't have time to go to church. Church Sunday. Hey, that's the only day I get to sleep in. Yeah, that's the only day I get to be with my friends and family. They'll have time for church. And then one day when they least expect it, a crisis strikes their life. And what's one of the first things out of their mouth? Oh, God, that's right. Oh, God, oh, help. Oh, why me? Hey, they got time to talk to God now. They got time to pray now. They might even find time to read their Bible. They might even find time to show up at church. Pressure, it orients people toward God. So the first objective in preparing this clay, we got to get it oriented in the potter's direction. And the potter uses pressure to do this. Now, before we go on to the next point, I want you to get a hold of this truth tonight, friend. Listen, you need to know that God has a plan and a purpose for your life. Yeah. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. You need to know, listen, that you were born on purpose and you were born for a purpose. You were born on purpose and you were born for a purpose. Your life was not a mistake. Your life was not an accident. Hey, hey, it may have been a surprise to your parents. Come on. Yeah, but, but look, it, it, it wasn't a surprise to God. Come on, you know the Bible tells us in Psalm 139, in verse 16, that God was planning out the days of your life long before your parents even knew each other. Come on. He just used them to get you here. And I can't tell you the number of people I've spoken to, even Christian people, who are supposed to know better. And they've said to me, well, I was a surprise. I was a mistake. I was an accident. No, you weren't. For Listen, God does not make mistakes. God doesn't create accidents. Come on. You were born on purpose. And you were born for a purpose. And listen, friend, this is a big purpose. It's a purpose that involves more than you just working really hard so you can make lots of money and buy lots of things that everybody else is only going to be fighting over after you're dead. Come on. That's what happens. That's what happens. God's plan for your life is so much bigger than that. And if you want to know what that plan is, if you want to be walking in that plan, the first thing you've got to do, you've got to get yourself oriented in a God direction. And I'm not talking now about playing Christian or playing church. I'm saying it's time you get serious in your relationship with the Lord and you begin seeking God for the plans he has for your life. And sometimes, sometimes God allows a little pressure in our life to get us oriented in that direction. Okay, the second objective here in, in preparing this clay is it works, it works the impurities out of the clay. And you think, well, what kind of impurities does clay have? It has two kinds. It has earthen impurities, things the clay picks up from just living in the world. Then, then once those impurities are removed, then the primary impurities become little pockets of air. They get trapped inside the clay. And you think, well, what harm could a little air do? Hey, what harm could a little air do if it's caught in your heart or in your brain? It's just a little air. Come on, it can be fatal to you. 
And so it is the clay. See, anything that's in this clay, that's not supposed to be there. It compromises the integrity of the clay. And if this clay is going to fail anywhere, if it's going to break or fall apart, it's going to fail in those areas where its integrity has been compromised. Now, not only that, but sooner or later in this formation process, this clay has got to be heated up. Now, when the clay is heated up, any residual moisture that's in this clay, and there always is, it turns into vapor. Now, when moisture turns into vapor, it expands over 1,100 times its size. Now, when the moisture leaves those platelets of clay, those platelets, they shrink and they form a denser mass. So what happens here is you've got the temperature in the kiln increasing. Now, the moisture turns to vapor. The vapor gets trapped in those air pockets. Now, the clay is shrinking, but the vapor is expanding, so it can't get out. Then as the temperature continues to increase, the vapor continues to expand. The pressure builds up and ultimately that pot, it's going to explode. And it doesn't just pop. That thing explodes. It's unbelievable what one impurity in this clay can do. Listen, one contaminant in this clay, it can prevent this clay from ever reaching its fullest potential. Now, not only that, but because it takes so much energy to fire a kiln, when potters do what they call their first firing, they're going to pack that pottery in as tightly as they can get it because they want to get as much as they can out of all that energy. So they're going to put pots inside of pots, pots on top of pots. They cram pots next to each other. And when one pot explodes, it can often do collateral damage and hurt those pots that are near it. And so the second objective in preparing this clay is it works the impurities out of the clay. Now, when I think about our life, I think, well, what are the impurities in our life? Don't call them out. Yeah. But, but the Bible calls them sin. Sin contaminates your life. Sin's going to cause you to compromise your integrity. If you're going to fail anywhere in your life, in your work, in your relationships, in your ministry, you're going to fail in those areas where your integrity has been compromised. Now I think, well, what does the potter use to work these impurities out of the clay? He uses that same pressure. Pressure brings the impurities in the clay to the surface so the potter can see them and remove them and continue to work with the clay. Now, when I think about our life, is there anything? Is there anything that can bring your sin nature to the surface more effectively than pressure? Come on. How you doing? Hey, how you doing when you when you uh, traffic isn't moving fast enough for you and and somebody comes along and you're late for your meeting and somebody comes along and they cut you right off. How's your sin nature then? Come on, church. How's your sin nature? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's moments like that. You wish you didn't have that Jesus bumper sticker on your car. Come on. Yeah, that's it. How, how you doing? How you doing when you feel, you know, they say a person's level of laughter reflects their level of guilt, right? You know that? Yeah, yeah, yeah just kidding. So, uh, uh, how, you, how you doing when you're feeling overworked and underpaid and taken advantage of and not appreciated? How's your sin nature? How's your sin nature when you have more bills than money to pay them? And you got the kids pulling at you and your partner's being unreasonable. How's your sin nature? How about you? How about you? Do you ever explode when you're under pressure? <laughs> you, ever, you ever do any collateral damage when you explode? And you hurt the people who are near you? Now listen, just like there's two kinds of impurities that contaminate this clay, earth and impurities and pockets of air, listen, so too the Bible implies that there are two kinds of sin that contaminate your life. And this sin is going to prevent you from ever reaching your fullest potential if you do not deal with it. Now, the first kind of sin that contaminates your life is what we call the sins of commission. These are the sins you commit. You commit them against other people. You commit them against yourself. You commit them against God. Now, the remedy the Bible has for the sins of commission, we see in 1 John 1, 9. If you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Then Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. If you bring in your gift to the altar, and there you remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift. Leave it. First go be reconciled to your brother, then come back and offer your gift. Now think about it. Why would your brother have something against you? Good, sweet little old you who never does anything wrong. Yeah, why would your brother have something against you? Your brother would have something against you because you did something to him. You hurt him. And Jesus is instructing us here, when you hurt your brother, you, you, the one who's at the altar, the one who thinks 
they're closer to God than the one who is not at the altar. Jesus is talking to you. And he's saying, you need to be the one. You need to be the one to take the initiative and go make that thing right. Listen, friend. You don't demonstrate for anyone how spiritually mature you are by showing them how long you can outweigh them. Just, just waiting for them to come to you first and apologize. That doesn't demonstrate your level of spiritual maturity. It does demonstrate something about you, though, but it's not your level of spiritual maturity. The mark of spiritual maturity we see in Micah chapter 6, verse 8. It is to do justly. That means be fair. Be fair in all of your dealings. Don't be trying to rip people off. Don't be trying to take advantage of people. Don't be making friends with people just for what you can get out of them. You, you do justly. Then it says you love mercy. That means you don't have to pay everybody back with your passive aggression when you don't get your way. And then it says you to walk humbly. The mark of spiritual maturity is you walk humbly. You take the first step and you go clean that mess up. So the first kind of sin that contaminates your life, it is the sins that you commit against other people. <clears throat> the second kind of sin that contaminates your life, it is the sins that other people commit against you. The sins other people commit against you. And you never deal with those sins or those people the way Jesus instructs you to. Oh no, you're not going to forgive the people who hurt you. No way. Instead, you get mad at them and you harden your heart toward them and you plot your revenge toward them and you say, I'm never going to trust that person again. I'm never going to trust anybody. You can't trust people because they hurt you. And you walk around angry and bitter and jealous and resentful and depressed and cynical. And listen, these are all the fruits of unforgiveness. And so you walk around with this attitude of anger and unforgiveness in your heart because of the ways people have hurt you or how unfair you think life has treated you. Listen to me, friends. This is the most dangerous thing you can do. It affects every area of your life. Did you know the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 and 27, when you hold on to your anger and your unforgiveness, the Bible tells us that there's a stronghold that gets a hold of your life now and it robs you of the joy and the victory and the peace in your heart and mind Jesus died for you to have. You cannot go walking around holding on to your anger and unforgiveness and at the same time go skipping around saying you just love Jesus and you're going to serve the Lord. The Bible tells us in 1 John 4.20, it says, How can you say you love God who you cannot see, yet you hate your brother who you can see and who's made in the image of God. You can't do it. And so you say to me, well, listen, I'm, I'm never going to forgive that person for what they did to me. And I still love Jesus. I'm not saying you don't love Jesus. I'm saying the Bible teaches us when you hold on to your anger and unforgiveness, that there's a stronghold that gets a hold of your life and robs you of the victorious life Jesus died for you to have. You see, from when you hold on to your anger and unforgiveness and say that you love Jesus, what you do, what you do, you move your relationship with God. You move it from your heart up into your head. And now you have nothing more than an intellectual understanding of God. You got nothing more than dead religion. That's what you got. And you go around saying, oh God, I love you. Lord, I want to serve you. Oh, use me in some great way while you're at every church service. Oh, you run from Bible study to Bible study. You got all the books. You bought all the tapes. And you know all this fascinating biblical trivia. You got all this great spiritual knowledge, but you have got no spiritual power. Come on, church. You got no power. Yeah. Yeah. You are spiritually impotent. You're still controlled by your depression. You're ruled by your fears. You're paralyzed by your anxieties. You're still in bondage to your addictions. You can't control your anger. Your thought life's in the wrong place more times than it's in the right place. You don't know how to have a healthy relationship with another human being. Your marriage, if you still have one, is void of the joy and excitement it used to once have. And you stand in there saying, well, I, I guess this Christian thing just doesn't work that well. No, friend, this Christian thing works really good. It's just not working for you because you got nothing more than dead religion. That's all you got. Listen, if you want to live the victorious life Jesus died for you to have, then friend, you've got to heal from the ways people have hurt you. You've got to heal from the ways people have hurt you. And the first step, the first step in this healing process, <laughs> you need to forgive them. 
and you need to learn to walk in an attitude of forgiveness. Now, don't shut me off. Don't shut me off because I said you have to forgive the people who hurt you. I'm going to tell you now why it's so hard for you to do this. And if you can get a hold of this principle, friend, it's going to change your life. It's going to break strongholds in your life. The reason it's hard for you to forgive people when they've hurt you is because, quite frankly, you have grown up believing a lie. Yeah, you. You believed a lie. And this is an excellent lie, like as far as lies are concerned. Because this lie was crafted by the father of lies. And this lie was created to keep you in bondage to your past. And the lie goes like this. The lie leads you to believe that if you forgive the people who've hurt you, that what it means you're really saying is that you've gotten over what they've done to you. It doesn't bother you anymore. They don't have to suffer any consequences for what they did to you. Why, you could even be friends if that's the way you want to take your relationship. But listen to me, friend. That is not what forgiveness means. That is not what forgiveness was designed for. Now listen to me. It will never be okay that somebody molested you. That's not going to be okay. And statistically, two out of four girls and three out of five boys are sexually molested before the age of 18. It's never going to be okay somebody molested you. It's never going to be okay somebody hurt you or violated you in some way. Never going to be okay somebody beat you up. Never going to be okay somebody forced you to have an abortion against your will. Never going to be okay somebody's unfaithful to you. Never going to be okay somebody divorces you. Never going to be okay somebody steals from you. Never going to be okay somebody lies about you and gossips about you and slanders you and tries to malign your character and sabotage your success. Never going to be okay somebody walks out of your life and never comes back. These things are never going to be okay. Never. See, the Bible makes it really clear. Deuteronomy 32, 35. When people sin against us in these ways and in other ways, the Bible makes it clear. God is going to vindicate you. God's going to vindicate you. God's a just God, a righteous God, a holy God, a God who vindicates the oppressed. And when people sin against us in these ways and in other ways, the Bible makes it clear. God is going to vindicate you, but he's going to do it in his time and in his way, not yours, because God knows more than you. Hey, believe it or not, God knows more than you. And God's got a bigger plan than you. In the meantime, God makes forgiveness available to you as a way of releasing you from the power and the control that that person who hurt you is still holding over your life. You need to understand, friend, forgiveness is a powerful spiritual principle that's designed to set you free, not the people who've hurt you. Now listen, the devil, he's no fool. The devil's no fool. And the devil begins to work early in your life. To sabotage your ability to forgive people. And he starts it with this little childhood saying, and I'm curious this evening, I want to take me a survey. I want you to raise your hand if you have ever heard this little childhood saying. I'm curious, how many of you have ever heard this, all right? The saying goes like this. You need to forgive and forget. Just forgive and forget. Raise your hand if you've ever heard that saying, you've got to forgive and forget. Come on now, look at that. Just about everybody in the house. Hey, no wonder you're so messed up. <laughs> yeah, what? Well, why do you know, do you know that I have actually heard that preached from the pulpit? I've heard it preached from the pulpit that the Bible teaches us as Christians, we need to forgive and forget. Well, let's clean this mess up right here. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. The Bible does not teach us that as Christians, we are to forgive and forget. The only mention, the only mention of forgiving and forgetting in the Bible, you're going to find it in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 34. And this is where God's talking about a new covenant that he's going to make with all people for all time. One that transcends the old sacrificial law. No more killing animals to make atonement for your sin. And we come into this covenant when we open our heart, ask Jesus Christ to come into our life, to forgive us of our sins, the sins of commission. And when we do this, we enter into what the New Testament calls a new and better covenant. And God says in the context of this new and better covenant, I'm going to forgive you of your wickedness. I'm going to remember your sins no more. God is the only one who can forgive and forget. And I don't know about you, friend, but that's good news for me. Hallelujah. That's good news. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's good news. Yeah. But you can't do that. You can't do that. And I'm going to explain to you now why, why you can't do that. You need to know that physiologically it's impossible to forget. I'm going to give you a quick lesson now in cognitive science. This is graduate level material. So strap yourself in for about 60 seconds. Here we go. 
when your brain is exposed to information or experience, that information or experience, it gets encoded chemically and electrically, and it gets stored in a series of neural connections in your cortex, in your brain, in what cognitive scientists call a neural network, and that's where it stays forever until you die. Now, when that neural network is stimulated, activated by a sensory cue, the data in that network gets sent through a neural pathway into your frontal lobe, and you retrieve a conscious memory of it. Wow, you didn't expect to get that at church tonight, did you? Come on. Yeah. Yeah, but you did. Now, now this is why you can be older. And then you're exposed to some kind of sensory cue. Maybe it's the holiday season, right? Thanksgiving, Christmas, everybody's cooking, everybody's baking. And then you go outside and the air is filled with aroma. And all of a sudden, oh, you smell something grandma used to make. And next thing you know, you're thinking about grandma. Or did you ever have something like this happen to you? You're driving in your car. You're listening to the radio. And all of a sudden, an oldies tune comes on. A song you haven't heard in years, maybe even decades. And you just catch the first couple notes of that song. And all of a sudden, ooh, the words come back to you. You start singing that song, driving your car, going down memory lane. Yeah, thinking of that season in your life. And, and look, you thought you forgot that memory. You could not have called that memory up if somebody asked you to. But do you see what happened here? You were exposed to the right sensory cue, that auditory cue that held the neural network that had that experience and it sends it into your conscious mind. Okay, why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because you need to know, friend, you are never going to forget about the rotten things that were done to you. And if you're waiting to forget about the rotten things that were done to you before you start forgiving the rotten things that were done to you, listen to me, friend, you're going to remain a prisoner. You're going to remain a prisoner, held captive to and tormented by painful memories from your past. So listen to me now. For the Christian, the biblical injunction is not to forgive and forget because you simply can't do it. For the Christian, the biblical injunction is to forgive and let go. You forgive and you let this thing go. This is what the Apostle Paul meant in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, when he said, forgetting what lies behind me and straining toward what lies before me, I press on to the mark of the price. He wasn't talking about forgetting cognitively here. How do we know this? Because how does he start the chapter? He starts it with a whole overview of his history. I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I persecuted the church. Listen, Paul did not forget his past. Paul did not forget his shame. Paul did not forget the shameful things he'd done or the shameful things that he'd been a part of. But what he's saying here, he's saying as a new creature in Christ, all things pass away, all things become new, and I am no longer going to allow my past to determine my future, and neither should you, church. Come on, neither should you. That's good news. That's good news. So I'm going to give you my definition for forgiveness. Forgiveness doesn't mean you've gotten over something. Look, there's some things we never get over. I've got some things in my life, the pain, the scars are so deep, I'll never get over them. But you can transcend them through Christ. Some things we don't ever get over, but we can transcend through Christ. Forgiveness doesn't mean you've gotten over something. Forgiveness means that you are releasing to God the responsibility for your vindication. That's what it means. When you forgive somebody, you're taking your hands off that thing so God can do something with it. Listen, listen. You want to hold on to your pain? You want to hold on to all those injustices and the way people did you wrong? You want to hold on to all that mess and manage it yourself? God will let you do it. God will let you keep it. Yeah, you can have it. Hey, hey, listen. How are you doing with it so far? Yeah. Come on. How are you doing with it so far? Aren't you tired? Aren't you tired of carrying that junk around with you? Forgiveness doesn't mean you've gotten over something. It means you're releasing to God the responsibility for your vindication. Look, there's an old saying, and it goes like this. Keeping unforgiveness in your heart, it's like drinking poison, hoping someone else will die. Come on, church. Come on. What are you drinking? <laughs> Time to spit that stuff out of your mouth and take hold of the future and hope Jesus died for you to have. You will never go forward with your life holding on to the pain of the past. It isn't going to happen, friend. It's time for you to forgive and let go. And you trust God to clean up the mess. And you take a hold of the future and hope Jesus died for you to have. Okay, so the second objective in preparing this clay is it works the impurities out of it. If this clay is going to be fashioned into something beautiful, you got to deal with the junk that's inside of it. Your life going to be fashioned into something beautiful? you got to deal with the junk that's inside of it. Okay, the third objective in preparing this clay is it cultivates a relationship between the potter and the clay. See, there's all different kinds of clay. It's not just clay. 
And if the potter's going to work effectively with the clay, they have to understand the characteristics of it. And the only way that happens is you've got to spend time together. You've got a relationship. And Isaiah the prophet understood this. He wrote about it in a beautiful way. Listen to what he says in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8. He says, Yet, O Lord, you are our father, and we are the clay. You are the potter, and we're all the work of your hands. He's talking about a relationship here. And listen to how he describes this. He begins by saying, yet, O Lord. So he recognizes and acknowledges God is the sovereign Lord. God is the Lord of heaven and earth. And he wants to be the Lord of your life too. And that happens when you say yes to God. And you open your heart. And ask Jesus Christ to come into your life. To forgive you of your sins. The sins of commission. And as you surrender your will to his, he becomes the Lord of your life. But listen, friends. God loves you. God loves you. And that's really good news. And he wants more. He wants more with you. He wants to have a love relationship with you. He wants to be your heavenly father. Now listen to me, church. God loves you. And God wants to be your heavenly father. And God is nothing like your earthly father. No matter how great of a guy your earthly father may have been, or no matter how terrible of a person he may have been, God is nothing like him. And I'm saying this to you because I talk to a lot of people, and sometimes people will tell me they want to have a relationship with God, but they find it really hard, hard to trust God. I was talking to a woman once in her mid-30s. This is what she said to me. She said, I love Jesus. I just don't trust him. I love Jesus, I just don't trust them. She doesn't trust the author of life and of love. And when we deconstruct this fear and get to the root of it, we discover the reason it's hard for them to trust God is because somewhere along life's way, they were not able to trust their earthly father. And they think because they couldn't trust their earthly father, now they can't trust their heavenly father. But God is nothing like your earthly father, friend. Listen, listen, God is never going to embarrass you in front of your friends. God's never going to shame you. God's never going to criticize you and make you feel like you can't ever do anything right. God's never going to call you fat, dumb, ugly, and stupid. God's never going to tell you you're never going to amount to anything. God is never going to violate your body. You never have to worry about God running off with someone else. You're never going to see God beat up your mother. You're never going to see God addicted to anything. You never have to walk around on eggshells with the Lord wondering what kind of a mood he's in. You never have to worry about God walking out of your life and never coming back because God is nothing like your earthly father. Hallelujah. Come on, church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, I take this... I take this illustration all over. I've had two people come up to me at the, at the end of a service once. A, a middle-aged man in one location and a middle-aged woman in another. And they both said to me the same thing. They said, they said, when I was 12, when I was 15, I was an eyewitness. I saw my father murder my mother. I watched the police take him away. I, I lost my family that day. And I've grown up clinging to God out of desperation. But I've always been afraid to trust him because of what happened to my mother. I said to those two people, I said, look, God did not kill your mother. God's not going to kill your mother. And he's not going to kill your father. And he's not going to kill your sister or your brother or your children or your friends or your marriage or your parents' marriage. That's not God. The Bible tells us in John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world. What did he do, church? He gave. He gave. See, God's a lover and love gives. God does not want to take from you. The only thing God wants to take from you is your sin-stained life and your broken heart. But Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, I came that you would have life and that it be a good life. <laughs> but you know what he also said in that same verse? He said, oh, but there is somebody who's come to kill your mother. Yeah, there is. And there's someone who's come to kill your father. And there's someone who's come to kill your sister and your brother and your children and your friends and your marriage and your parents. There is someone who's come to kill those, but it's not God. It's the devil. It's the enemy of your soul. Look, at don't blame God for the things the devil has done or for the consequences of the rebellious choices you have made. Don't blame God because he is a good God and he's nothing like your earthly father. I said to those two people, I said, look, at you've been mad at the wrong father. You need to be mad at the father of lies, not the father of lights, who's the giver of everything that is good and perfect, because God is nothing like your earthly father. Then after Jesus is your Lord and your heavenly father, then he's going to be your potter. And he's going to take your life, your broken life, and he's going to fashion it into something beautiful. Something that goes beyond your wildest imaginings. But this is the order. Yet, oh Lord, you are our father. We're the clay, you're the potter. We're all the work of your hands. It's lordship first, relationship next. Then comes the formationship. 
Well, this clay is ready now. It's ready. So you just don't come out of the swamp and go onto the wheel. You got to go through a little process first. But it's ready. So let's see if we can make something with it on the wheel. Now, when a potter is going to make something on their wheel, they've got to take the clay through several stages on the wheel. The first thing you got to do is you got to get the clay in the center of the wheel. Potters call that being centered. Oh, doesn't that look good? Yeah, that sounds so good. Yeah, that sounds really spiritual. Yeah, you, you, you see this, this, this clay? This clay here is not centered. No, it's not centered. It's on the wheel, but it's not centered. So what's it doing? It's just going around circles. That's all it's doing. It's just going around circles. You know what? I meet a lot of people like this. I meet a lot of Christians like this. Yeah. They're just going around in circles with their life. See, they confuse activity with accomplishment. You see, they think because they're running here and they're running there that something actually is getting accomplished for the kingdom. But the only thing that is happening is they're just running around in circles. <laughs> yeah, they're just getting dizzy. <laughs> but they're dizzy for Jesus. <laughs> yeah, come on, church. They're dizzy. They're dizzy for Jesus. Yeah. Hey, we have anybody here tonight who's, uh, who's dizzy for Jesus? Yeah, let me take a look at you. I tell you what, from where I'm sitting, I can see at least two of you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Come on, though. I bet if we were all honest, there were probably an awful lot of people in this room wondering who the other person was. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Now, look. As this clay spins around and around on this wheel, there is a force that's exerted onto this wheel. It's an invisible force. It's a centrifugal force. And it wants to take what's ever on this wheel and fling it off the wheel. It wants to pull it away from its relationship with the potter. And this clay cannot withstand this invisible force in its own strength. It needs the strength and the help of the potter. In the same way, the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, that this is a spiritual world we live in. And there are spiritual forces in this world. And these forces are trying to pull you away from your relationship with God. They're trying to distract you from your relationship with God. And just like this clay cannot withstand these invisible forces in its own strength, it needs the strength and the help of the potter. You cannot withstand these spiritual forces in your own strength. This is why we need the active and dynamic working of the Holy Spirit in our life. Now, once this clay comes into the center, it enters into a stillness, a, a place of rest here. I don't, have to, I don't have to put as much pressure on it. I just need to contain it here. This part here, this reminds me of God speaking to us through the psalmist. Listen to what God says in Psalm 46, verse 10. He says, be, be still and know that I am God. What God is telling us in this psalm is that we come into a knowledge of God in the stillness that we do not come into when we're not still. This is why it's so important that you develop a quiet time. A devotional life where you could shut yourself in with God. So God can reveal himself to you in the stillness in ways he cannot when you're not still. This is why God doesn't say through the psalmist, get busy and know that I'm God. Get overcommitted and know that I'm God. Or burn yourself out and know that I'm God. No, it's be still. Now that it's still, it's ready for the next phase. And that is we're going to open it now. Now, the way the potter opens the clay is you, you take your fingers and you're going to plunge them right into the heart of this clay. And then you're going to draw the clay open. Now, this is a very intimate time between the potter and the clay. Because there is a real searching out 
that's going on here. You see, if there's something in this clay that's not supposed to be there, this is where I'm going to find it. This searching out process, this reminds me of the heart of the psalmist. Listen to what the psalmist prays in Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. He prays, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there's any offensive way in me and guide me in the way everlasting. That's what's happening here. There's a searching out that's going on here. This clay is now open. Let me show you. It's open. You see? It's open. Taking a picture? There we go. There we are. Come on now, church. Laughter works well like a good medicine, doesn't it? Yeah. I think church ought to be the happiest place in town. Come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, church ought to be the happiest place in town, right? Most of the time, you just see a room full of grumpy people, though. We don't, we don't want to. No, you got to have a testimony of the goodness of God, right? See, people don't realize you got to have a testimony. First thing you got to have is a test, right? Yeah. Most Christians, though, all I see them expressing is the moanies. Yeah, you don't, you, you don't, you don't want that. You got to have a testimony. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Bless the Lord. <laughs> so, so the next phase now, once the clay has been centered and open, now the next phase is we're going to lift it. Now, the way the potter lifts the clay, you've got to apply pressure, pressure to the inside of the clay and pressure to the outside of the clay at the same time. And then you're going to begin the process of drawing the clay upward. And this is a process. And like any process, it takes some time. And you don't want to rush the process. You don't want to rush the process. This process here, this process here, this reminds me of James chapter 4, verse 10. Humble yourself before the Lord. And He will lift you. Pressure on the inside. And pressure... On the outside. How about you? Did you ever have pressure on the inside of your life and the outside of your life at the same time? What do you do when that happens? Do you grumble? Do you whine? <coughs> Do you complain? <coughs> Do you make life miserable for everyone around you? Or do you allow God to lift the Christ-like character out in your life so that others can see Christ in you, your hope of glory? Now, now that's lifted, it's ready for the next phase. And that is, we're going to do an internal work on this, on this clay now. We're going to do an internal work. Now, <clears throat> with my outside hand here. You'll notice that I am steadying 
the clay. I'm supporting the clay. I am protecting the clay. But what I want you to observe is that all the work is taking place on the inside of the clay. And we see the work that's taking place on the inside of the clay by the way it is reflected on the outside of the clay. See, this is, this is exactly how God works. God works from the inside out. Religion works from the outside in. See, religion says, you do this, and you do that. And you don't do this, and you don't do that. And then you're going to be something you're not. And neither are you capable of being, which is holy and righteous. But the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, that it is by grace you have been saved through faith. That this is a gift of God's. It is not of works. You cannot work your way into righteousness. Jesus Christ did that on the cross. This is the whole reason why we ask Jesus to come into our life. His Holy Spirit comes into our life like my hand goes inside this pot. And he does a transforming work from the inside out. And people see the work that God is doing in your life by the way it's reflected on the outside of your life. Oh, Lord, glory to God. Come on, church. A vessel of honor right here, church. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on, church. Hallelujah. All right, thank you. <laughs> that, that was good. That was... I like that. Thank you for your, your clapping. I really appreciate that. Uh, I want to challenge your thinking, though. I want to challenge your thinking for just a minute, okay? I want you to think about this. Uh, what were you clapping for? See, I'm, I'm asking you that because when I came up here and I said, I am going to do several illustrations with these pieces of clay, like nobody clapped. <laughs> <laughs> nobody clapped. <laughs> and so now I make some of them with a piece of clay. Everybody's clapping. What you clapping for? See, see, you're clapping because you understand something now you didn't understand before. You see something now you didn't see before. You see, you saw this clay. It came into a relationship with the potter. It didn't have to be perfect. It didn't have to have its act all together. It just had to be willing. And because it was, the potter was able to draw out from this clay something you did not see before. But you see it now. And that is its potential. And you got a little excited. So you started clapping. Did you know that's exactly what Jesus meant in Luke chapter 15, verse 7? When he said that all of heaven rejoices when one sinner comes to repentance. Hallelujah. Yes. Glory to God. Hallelujah. When you say yes to God, the Bible tells us that all of heaven does for you what you just did for that clay. All of heaven claps for you because now all of heaven can see potential for a kingdom work in your life that it couldn't see before. Now listen, how come all of heaven can get excited about the potential it sees in your life, but you can't? 
Come on, church. How come you can't? Now look, I'm happy. I'm happy that it came out like that. I mean, especially since everybody's looking at me. I mean, you try this, not, not easy. I'm, I'm happy, but I don't get real excited here. No, no. This is where I start getting excited. See, as soon as I come into a relationship with this piece of clay, this is where I start getting excited because I can see some things in here that you can't because I'm the potter. Ooh, yeah. Come on, church. Yeah. You know what I see when I look into a big ball of clay like this? You know what I see? When I look into a big ball of clay like this, I'll tell you what I see. I'm an Italian boy. And when I see me big ball of clay like this, I always see me this big bowl of pasta. Spicy shrimp. Lots of garlic. Mamma mia. That's worth a little hand clap, church. Come on. Woo. Yeah. <laughs> I'm fun. <laughs> yeah. I'm getting a little hungry, too. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But I want you to think about this from a functional standpoint. From a functional standpoint. This clay here is of no more functional use to me than this clay here, is it? I could see what I can do with this clay. But I can see it right here. I don't need that. Now, if I want to use this clay for the potential for which I have just destined it, I have to take it through a few more stages. The first thing I have to do is I have to set its potential. I have to set it. And the way the potter sets the clay's potential is I have to take this clay now and I must put it into the fire. It's the only way. And this is not a little fire. To set that clay mix, I have to heat it up to 1,800 degrees. Wow. There is not much that can withstand 1,800 degrees. I'll put that in perspective for you. I was talking to the director of a funeral home one day. Hey, listen, church, you want to have an exciting conversation? <laughs> then do not talk to the director of a funeral home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because I'll tell you right now, that conversation is going to be totally dead. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, know it's, I know it's a little corny, but it's true. It's true. I really spoke to one. And it really was totally dead. And uh, he, he worked with a crematorium. You know these big ovens that cremate people? And I was curious because my father, my father was cremated after he died. It's, it's the best time. And so, and so I asked him, I said, I said how hot? How, how hot do you have to make those ovens in order to take the entire lifetime of another human being and reduce it down to a little five pound bag of gray ash. How hot? He said, 1,800 degrees. And I thought, whoa. That's, that's the same temperature I fire my pots to. And I was driving away thinking about that. And all of a sudden, I'm reminded of Jesus' words in Mark 835, where he said, if any man's going to save his life for the kingdom of heaven, you're going to have to lose it to this world. Yeah. You want your life to count for heaven, friend? You're going to have to die to some of the things on this planet. But when this thing comes out of the fire... It's going to look like this. You see all these pots here. They've all been fired to 1,800 degrees. This is the same clay mix. Notice it's gotten a little lighter. I like to think of it now as it is reflecting the Shekinah glory of God. See, fire has a way of purifying things, doesn't it? Not only that, but look it, look it. It's hard. Fire gives strength to things, doesn't it? Not only that, but listen, see if you can hear this. Listen, shh, listen, listen. Hear that? That's a note. God made that note. I like to think of it as this pot's got a song now. This pot's got a song. Here, here's an observation that I have made. I am a student of human behavior. And here's an observation that I have made. When you go through the fires with your life, not if you go, <laughs> when you go. <clears throat> Did you know? That's actually a promise from God in Isaiah 43, 2. It says you are going to walk through the fire. You're going to walk through it. It's a promise. How many want to claim that promise? Yeah, come on, church. We want to claim the blessing promises, right? We want the prosperity promises. We want the healing promises. Who wants the fire walk promise? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're going to walk through it. When you do, when you do, stay faithful to God. 
Stay faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't turn your back on God, friend. Don't shake your fist at God because God knows more than you. God's got a bigger plan than you. And if you will stay faithful, listen, if you will stay faithful to God as you're going through your fire, you read the second half of Daniel chapter 3, verses 24 and 25, and you will discover as you're faithful to God going through your fire, God has a way of showing up in the middle of your fire. Yes, he does. He's going to show up in the middle of your fire. Yeah. And when you come out of that thing, and listen, church, you're going to come out. When you come out of it, your life's going to have a song. Hallelujah. Your life's going to have a song. Come on, church. It'll be a song of praise, a song of thanksgiving, a song of healing, a song of deliverance, a song of provision. Your life is going to have a song. Yeah, hallelujah. <laughs> but here's the way it works. <laughs> Want the song for your life? <laughs> you got to go through the fire to get it. Now, I don't know if you could see it in the back. You could see it in the front. When I made this pot here, did you see how I put a little squiggly line on it? A potter's call that a form of surface removal. But what I've done in a very literal sense here is I have scarred this pot. I put a scar on it. I just did it in a symmetrical way so it's easy to look at. I did it on this pot here too. Maybe you can see it in the shadows. Another potter is going to come along and pick this pot up and see the scarring on it. And it's going to tell them a story about how this pot was made because that's what scars do, right? Scars tell stories, don't they? I've got some scars on my body and when I look at them, I'm reminded of how I got them. When my children see them, they say, Daddy, how did you get that scar? And now I've got a story to tell them. I was a deep sea diver in the United States Navy for four years. So when my, my babies were little, I used to tell them the shark story. Yeah. 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 I just made that one up, though. <laughs> yeah, but that was such a scary story. When my babies were little, they wouldn't get in the bathtub for a week after that story. Oh, yeah, that was, that was a scary story. Yeah. Scars, they tell stories, don't they? You tell somebody you were molested when you were little. That's a scar. And that scar tells a story. And you don't have to say anything else about your story, especially if you're telling someone else who was molested. See, because they know your story. Scars tell them. You tell somebody you had an abortion. That's a scar. Three out of five women, 40 years of age in the United States have had one. And you don't have to say anything else about your story, especially if you're telling someone else who had an abortion. See, they know your story. You tell somebody you went through a painful divorce. That's a scar. And that scar tells a story. And you don't have to say anything else about your story. Especially if you're telling someone else who went through a painful divorce. They know your story. Scars tell them. You tell somebody you grew up in an alcoholic family. That's a scar. And that scar tells a story. And you don't have to say anything else about your story. Especially if you're telling someone else who grew up in an alcoholic family. They know your story. Scars tell them. Now look, I don't like these scars. I don't, I don't want them in my life. I'm trying to take them off, but they're, they're not coming off. Listen, friends, you cannot undo your past. You cannot undo your past. I can hide it, though. Oh, I can hide the scars. All I've got to do is put the glaze real heavy on it right here. And when it comes out of the glaze firing, you're never going to know they're there. But from the potter's perspective... Why allow a pot to be scarred if you're only going to hide it now? You see, now that it's made it this far, it's now eligible for the next phase. And that is, I am now going to adorn this pot with glaze. But in order for the glaze to fulfill its relationship with this pot, guess what has to happen? It's got to go back into the fire. And this time I'm going to heat it even hotter. The glaze fire, this pot, I have to heat it up to 2,350 degrees. You ever see these science shows with the volcanoes and the magma blasting out of that thing and the lava leaching down the mountain consumes everything in its path and you think, man, how hot do those rocks get to melt like that? When scientists measure lava at the surface temperature, it's 2,000 degrees. This pot's going to be heated up 350 degrees hotter than molten lava. But when it comes out of the fire, depending on the glaze that you use, hey, it could look like this. Now, what I want you to notice, if you can see it, is do you see the scarring on this pot? Do you see the scarring on it? 
You see the way the glaze breaks over the scarring? It breaks over it, and it accentuates this scarring, and it gives this pot a sense of movement. It gives this pot a sense of dynamic. It gives this pot a sense of beauty that other pots that are not scarred simply do not have. And I'll guarantee you, I guarantee you what you would do if I put this thing out here. See, I know what you do. I spent my life studying what you do. This is what you do. I put this thing right here. This is what you're going to do. You're going to walk into the sanctuary thinking you're the only one in here. You're going to stand in front of that for a little bit, just look at it, and then you're going to do one of these things with your body. You go like this. Because you want to make sure nobody's looking. Then you're going to reach over like this, you're going to pick this thing up, and the first thing you're going to do, you're going to go like this. See, you're going to touch the scarring. You think just your kids touch everything? You don't outgrow that. You've got to touch, touch everything, don't you? Yeah, that's, it. that's exactly what you do. Yeah, see, see, there's something about the scarring that makes people want to connect with it. Here's another observation that I've made. Listen, friends, listen to me. If you will give those things that have scarred your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, if you'll give those things that have left their indelible mark in your soul, stop trying to cover it up with the glazes that this world has to give. You give your broken life to Jesus Christ. He's going to take your broken life. He's going to pour his healing balm over you. How he does this, I do not know. It's part of the mystery of the cross. But you're going to experience the fulfillment of Isaiah 61.3. God's going to give you beauty for your ashes. You're going to get the oil of joy for your mourning. God's going to give you the garment of praise for your spirit of heaviness. You know what your spirit of heaviness is, friend? That's your depression. God's going to lift that thing from you because it's not his will for you to have it. And then you know what God's going to do? He's going to bring people into your life. And you know where they're going to connect with you? Right here. Right here. Right around your scarring. Right around your pain. Right around your brokenness. Now, why does God do this? Why does he do it? So you can sit around now and have a little victim talk together? No. No, he does it so you can now point them to the one where you found healing for your broken life so they can find it for theirs. Come on. Gloria a Dios. Hallelujah. Yes. Bless the Lord forever. Hallelujah. That's the gospel. That's the gospel right there. That's the gospel. Yeah, that's more than all right, brother. That's good. That's good news. <laughs> that's good news. Yeah, I want to show you something else. See this? I cut this all out of the same lump. But see this one here? I did something to this one. I let it dry out. See, did you notice when I was making that first pot? Did you notice how I kept putting water on it? See, clay has to have a certain level of, of water in it, a certain level of moisture in order to be moldable. Now, in this illustration, the water is very symbolic. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, the apostle Paul is explaining how Christ sanctifies the church. And he says he sanctifies her by washing her with water through the word. So the water in this illustration represents the word of God. As you keep the word of God washing over your life by praying, by reading your Bible, by memorizing scripture, by getting under spiritual authority, by getting connected to community. When God speaks to you to direct your life, you're going to hear him. You're going to hear him. This clay here, this represents the person who has dried out spiritually. They're not reading their Bible. They're not memorizing scripture. They're not praying unless if they're in trouble. They're not going to come under spiritual authority. No, this is the gospel according to them. Yeah. This is the person the Bible calls hard-hearted, stiff-necked, prideful, arrogant. So what can the potter do with clay that has dried out spiritually? Well, the first thing we've got to do is we've got to get this clay in the center whoa, in the center of the wheel. And this clay is fighting with me as I'm trying to hold it in the center. It's not cooperating with me. And it's actually talking to me now. And it's saying to me, don't tell me what to do. <laughs> I'm clay. Whoa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't tell me what to do. <laughs> So what can the potter do with clay that has dried out? Actually, I can't do anything with it. I can't do anything with it. So what does that mean for this clay now? Does that mean that this clay is now hopeless? No. No. This clay is not hopeless. It's just hard. 
<laughs> it's not hopeless. It's just hard. And I love this clay too much to discard it now simply because it's not listening to me. No, I love it too much. And do you know why I love this clay so much? Even though it's hard, even though it's not listening to me, even though it's resisting everything I'm trying to do with it. You know why I love it so much? I love it so much because I paid a price for it. Oh, this clay cost me something. This clay cost me something. Yeah, hallelujah. This clay cost me something and I'm not going to discard it simply because it's not listening to me. No, I'm going to redeem it. I'm going to bring it back. I'm going to bring it back. But in order to do that, I got to take it through a few more stages. The first thing I have to do with this clay is I got to let it dry out completely. See, you can't force more water into this. Laws of physics prevent that. And so I'm going to put it on a shelf in my shop. And I'll be letting it dry out. And I'm going to be watching it. And while it's drying out on the shelf, I'm going to take this clay, I'm going to go onto the wheel, and I'm going to make some really cool things. And I'm sure while this clay is sitting on the shelf drying out, watching me make really cool things with this clay, this clay is thinking to itself, that potter doesn't love me anymore. That potter doesn't care about me. I see it doing all this really cool stuff with this other clay. It's not doing anything with me. It doesn't love me anymore. No, I do love this clay. I love this clay just as much as I love this clay. Just as much as I love this clay. But you see, this clay, it's taught me something. It's not going to listen to me. And the clay doesn't tell the potter how we're going to do it. <laughs> it doesn't happen. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let it dry out. <laughs> You know what happens to clay when it dries out? It gets really brittle. Here, I brought a big heavy chunk of dry clay. I let this big heavy chunk of dry clay I let it dry out to show you. Look, look. It becomes... It becomes brittle. And then, I the potter. I'm going to take this hard clay. And I am going to break it. I'm going to break it. And do you know how I'm going to break this clay? I'll find something. <laughs> I'll find something that's going to work real good. And I'm not just going to break it in half. No, I'm going to break it into lots of pieces. Because the more pieces it's broken into, the more responsive it's going to be to the next phase. And then I'm going to take all these broken pieces and I'm going to put them into a basin. And then I'm going to pour water into that basin. And that dry clay is going to start absorbing that water. And that water is going to break down that hard clay just like the Word of God can break down the hardest heart of the hardest man. And I know because I was one of them. And then, after it's all broken down, I'm going to skim the water off of it, and I'm going to pour it all out on a big plaster slab, and the plaster is going to start absorbing that water, filtering out all the sediment, and I'll keep my hands on it. And when it gets to just the right consistency, I'll start wedging it up like this. And before you know it, I'll have me a ball of clay that's moist and malleable and ready to go onto the wheel to be fashioned into something beautiful. Here, you see this? You see this clay right here? This clay represents the person who loves God. They love the potter. They love the potter. Here, but you see this here? See this here? Uh, this, this is a pebble. I, I picked this up in my yard. You can order these from me. I'll mail them to you. They're from Connecticut. <laughs> yeah, just kidding. Yeah. Yeah. Look, look at, I'm going to take this pebble. And I'm sticking it into the clay here. That pebble, that represents a wound in the heart of this person. Maybe this person was molested when they were little. Maybe they were raped. Maybe they had an abortion or grew up in an alcoholic family. Or maybe they were abandoned. <laughs> That's one of my wounds. When I was 15, my, my mother ran away. And my father, he wasn't interested in being a father. 
I grew up in New York, just outside of this city. I have two sisters, a little sister and an older sister, and, and we grew up on the street. And from the age of 15 to 19, which is when I went into the Navy, the way I got most of the meals that I ate, I stole them. I'd go into the supermarket and I'd go up to the deli counter, ask for a pound of Italian roast beef. They wrap it up in the plastic the way they do and they hand it to the little boy on the other side of the counter. I'd take it and smile. Thank you. I'd go around the aisle and I'd drop that thing down my shirt. Then I'd go out into the street, find a place where I could sit down and eat it like some kind of animal. Nobody's going to take it from me. The autumn season of my 15th year, I was downtown walking the street. It was 2 o'clock in the morning. Downtown, 15 years old. I was so tired. I wanted to go to sleep. I found a parked car. It had a seat cover in it. I smashed the window, and I ripped the seat cover out of that car. I wrapped myself up in it, and I lay down on the side of the road, and I went to sleep. And then I got up the next morning, and I, I hitchhiked to where I was going. <laughs> I have four children now. And when I see how easy it is to love your children, when I see how easy it is to love your children, I say, why was it so hard? Why was it so hard for my parents? See, you grew up in a street like I did, and there's a lot of junk you've got to deal with. There's a lot of forgiving and letting go that has to happen. But see, this person here, they're not going to forgive and let go, no. They're going to hold on to their pain, hold on to their resentment, hold on to their bitterness, hold on to their jealousy, hold on to their anger. And they love Jesus. And they love Jesus. So what can the potter do with clay that's going to hold on to its pain? Hey, it can be centered, sure. But you know what? There's more to living for Jesus than sitting still with your life. When Jesus calls us to follow him, he calls us to action. And so this person, they get to this place in their life and they say, God, what's this all about? I mean, use me. I want my life, I want my life to count for something. Use me, God. And God likes that prayer. But you see, to be used by God, you've got to be opened by God. And so God's going to start to open you up. Ouch. Ow. You know, there's, there's a rock in here. Oh, wow. Ouch. And as it's spinning around, it's... <laughs> It's hitting my finger, and it really, really hurts me. And you say, well, then what are you doing it for? Because I'm trying to illustrate this for you. That's why I'm doing it. <laughs> that really hurts. But you know, when I think about this, when I think of how this hurts my finger, I think when we hold on to our pain, pain that Jesus died to set us free from, I think it hurts the heart of God. Now, do you remember... When I was talking about preparing the clay, how the potter uses pressure. And what does the pressure do to the impurities in the clay? It brings them to the surface. And so, can you see this thing right here? You see this? Right here. This is where the Christian is going to relapse into their addiction, right here. Pressure. This is where the Christian is going to lose their ability to manage their emotions. They're going to lash out and hurt somebody they care about. This is where the Christian's going to get involved in another abusive or exploitive relationship. So what do most Christians do when this starts to happen? When you start struggling with that old sin issue in you? What, what do most Christians do? Well, it's my observation. You're going to do this. Come on, church. You're going to hide it. You're going to hide it. And then what you're going to do is you're going to put on what I call... Your Christian happy face. Here it is right here. This is the Christian happy face right here. Come on. See, this is the face that you see most Christians wearing on a Sunday morning that makes you feel like everybody else in the church has got their act together except you. And you see them during the fellowship time and you say, hey, how you doing? And they say, I'm doing good. How are you? Oh, I'm doing good too. Oh, God is good, isn't he? All the time. Oh, come on. All the time. Oh, yeah, come on. Yeah. Oh, oh, you, you got the victory. Yeah, walking in the victory. Well, blessings on my brother. Well, 10,000 besides, see? 
So you got all the church talk down. You got all church talk down. You know, I grew up, I tell you, I grew up in the street. Maybe some of you grew up in the street. And when you grew up in the street, you got to learn the culture of that street, see? Because if you don't learn the culture of the street, the street's going to eat you up. It's going to eat you up. And so you got to learn. What does that mean? You got to learn to walk. You got to walk. There's a walk. You got to learn to walk. You got to walk. And you got to learn to talk. You got to talk, see, in order to survive the culture of the street. And when you get that stuff down, you know what they say? You know what they say you got? They say you're street smart. You're street smart. See, you understand the culture of the street. You know what you got to do to survive in the street. Well, listen, I've been in the church for a while now, and I have observed something I call church smart. Yeah, you're church smart. Yeah, you you know the walk, you got to walk. Come on, church. Oh, yeah, you know the talk, you got to talk. Yeah, come on, in order to survive the culture of the church. Come on, yeah. Well, guess what? Inside, you are dying. You're dying inside. You say, nobody cares about me here. They ask me how I'm doing. They don't stand around long enough to hear my answer. They don't care about me. After a while, you start thinking, God doesn't even care about you. Well, what happens then? Well, it's been my observation. In order to anesthetize your pain, you're going to start getting religious and you're going to join the worship team. No offense, worship team. No offense, worship team. Yeah. Oh, you're going to teach yourself a Sunday school. No offense, Sunday school. <laughs> and the newness of what you're doing. Hey, it distracts you from your pain. See, the problem is it doesn't heal you from your pain. It only distracts you. And like any good distraction, after a while, it's going to wear off. And you're going to need a bigger distraction. And so you say, God, use me in a greater way. <laughs> God likes that prayer. But a greater way means greater pressure. So God starts putting you under greater pressure. And now I want to tell you three reasons why it's so important that you heal from the pain of your past. From all that junk you're carrying around inside of you. All those injustices, all the way people did you wrong. I'm going to tell you three reasons why it's so important that you heal from those. The first two reasons are a little clinical in nature. But here they are. <clears throat> it's so important that you heal from that stuff in your life. Because if you don't, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to organize your life around your pain. This is what human beings do. <clears throat> if you don't heal from your pain, you organize your life around it. Everybody does. <clears throat> because, <clears throat> excuse me, because it's too painful to deal with. So you organize your life around your pain. And you know what? Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Now you see this, you see this uh, little cylinder, this little clay he here? You see, how, how can it accommodate that little pebble? It, it can't absorb it. So in order to accommodate it, in order to hold it in its life, it has to organize around it. And when it organizes around it, it throws the balance of this thing off. All this thing like this is because of that little pebble. And this is what it does in your life. You organize your life around your pain, and then you start feeling like your life is out of balance. Your relationships are out of balance. And then the devil comes along, <clears throat> and he says, well, that's just the way you are. See, you're messed up. Something's wrong with you. But that's not the way you are. You're not messed up. Proverbs 11.1 1 says, unjust weights, unjust measures, things that are out of balance. They're an abomination to the Lord. God doesn't make anything out of balance. And he did not make you out of balance. You're just organizing your life around your pain. You're just giving that pain too much power in your life. The second reason it's so important that you heal from the pain of your past is because... First, you're going to organize your life around it. And then the next thing you're going to do with it is you are going to recreate it. You're going to recreate it. You just do it in a different context with different people. Same old drama, just different faces. Come on, church. And the third reason you want to heal from the pain in your past is because, friend, listen to me. You're only going to go as far in your life. You're only going to go as far in your relationships with other people as your wounds allow you to go and no further. Don't think you're going to go further. You're not. You're only going to go as far in your life. You're only going to go as far in your relationships with other people as your wounds allow you to go and no further. <clears throat> so here you are. This is your life now. You're limping through life. 
trying to do the best you can, trying to love Jesus, trying to be a good person, and then one day when you least expect it, oh. Your life comes crashing down around you. And you sit here in your brokenness. You sit here in your confusion and you say, God, why me, God? Why me? Did your life ever look like this? My life has looked like this. My life has looked like this more than one time. And where does it break? That's it. You just got to run your hand along the edge. And so you finally come to the end of yourself. And you cry out to God. And you say, God, help me. Help me. I'm tired of trying to control everything and everybody. Help me. And God, who the Bible tells us in Psalm 46, 1, He is a very present help in our time of trouble. God, He comes along and He picks you up. He picks you up. He picks you up with all of your guilt, with all of your shame, with all of your addictions, with all of your messed up relationships. He picks up your broken life. And he carries you over to his special place. And there, he's going to dry your tears. And then, he's going to bring you through a process. He's going to bring you through a process of <clears throat> getting you reoriented in a God direction. A process of working more of the impurities out of your life. A process of re-establishing a love relationship with you. See, this is a love process here, friend. This is a redemptive process. At times, at times, it can be a little bit of a hard process, a little painful. But make no mistake about it. This is a love process. Now listen, I want to say something to you. Like, like personally, between me and you. Like if there was nobody else here. It's just you and me sitting down. And I'm talking to you. I want to talk to you like your brother. I'm your brother in Christ. We're going to spend eternity together, right? So you can start loving on me now if you want. Yeah. Yeah. So I can use it. So listen. Listen. I want to speak to you. You make a big mistake. You make a big mistake. To think that you don't have to deal with those painful issues in your life. That you can just put them in a little box. Stick them in the back of your life somewhere. Just keep going on living. It isn't going to happen. The mere fact that you've got to put that thing in a box is speaking to how much control that thing still has over your life. And if you're here tonight, friend, listen, I believe God's trying to give you some revelation that's going to set you free. I believe God wants to break a stronghold in your life. But you've got to say yes. You've got to do your part. God will do his part, but you've got to do your part. And I believe God's trying to show you something. And I hope you're going to respond. So then after the potter is ready. God, he's going to take, he's going to take your life. A life that was once so broken. And he's going to put you back on the wheel. But he puts all of you on the wheel. Because God wants all of you. God doesn't want to leave any part of you out. So he puts you on the wheel. And then he's going to center you. And you're patient now. See, because you've learned some things about God you didn't know before. You learn some things about his love, about his unconditional love, about his forgiveness, about his mercy. <clears throat> and 
And then, after God centers your broken life, He's going to open you. And He's going to search you out. And then, He's going to begin to lift you. But He lifts all of you. Because God wants all of you. God wants all of you. See this clay here? This was the person who was broken beyond recognition. This is the person who had given up on themselves. But the potter never gives up on the clay. <coughs> the potter never gives up on the clay. Listen, I want to say something to you. I had no intention. This was not in my head to share this, but I've been wrestling with this thing for a little while right now. You know, sometimes when you speak and you go around and you, you talk to people, you know, kind of like I do, and you, and, you know, you feel you want to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And then sometimes you feel like God wants you to say something. But then you get all nervous. And you think, God, is this you or is it me? And then you, you, you start this wrestling thing inside you. Like, oh, I don't want to say it. I, God, is it really you? Is it me? Is it you? Is it me? And then if you don't say it, then you leave and you think, oh, I should have said it. You know, I don't know if anything like that has ever happened to you before. But uh, I'm just being kind of transparent with you here. Because uh, I feel like God has been wanting me to say something. And I'm thinking, oh, God, is this you? Is this me? But I'd rather err on the side of, I don't want to walk out of this place thinking I should have said it. <clears throat> but as I'm doing this here, God is just impressing in my heart that there is someone here who thinks that this world would be better without them. That it'd be just so, so much easier for you to just stop living. And I want to encourage you, friend, please don't do that. I want you to see the hope that you have in Christ in this illustration. There is hope. Doesn't matter how bad it's been. Doesn't matter what the shame is or the violation is. There is hope. And I want you to see it in this. So please. You don't do that. Don't give up. If you need to talk to somebody, talk to a friend, talk to a pastor. Talk to Jesus. Okay? But, but don't give up. Then after the potter raises up your broken life, 1 Peter chapter 6, verse 7 says, Submit yourself under God's mighty hand, and He will exalt you in due season. Then, after God lifts, raises up your broken life, He's going to do an internal working on you. He's going to do an internal work. See, potters call this internal working. They call it giving the pot a form and a function. This is what potters call it. See, you make the cylinder, right? And now you've got to give it a purpose, right? You've got to give it a form and a function. That's what potters call it. I like to think of it as giving the pot a calling. Giving the pot a calling. Because this is what God does with your life. He's going to raise up your broken life. He's going to give you a calling. 
He's going to give you beauty for your ashes. He's going to give you calling. And then after God gives you a calling, he's going to do something with you that he was not able to do before. Because you just weren't ready. <clears throat> he's going to give you a calling. And then he's going to give you an equipping. And he's going to equip you in a way that you were not equipped before. Now, why does God do this? Why does he do this? He does this so that you can now take from your broken life and you can pour, you can pour into the life of another broken person. Come on, church. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. So you can pour into the life of another broken person so they can find healing for their broken life just like you found for yours. See, this is the message of a journey to the potter's house. This is the message of the cross. You see, this is my life. This is my life. My life has been so broken. But I know enough about human beings and about human behavior to know that this is your life too. And I am taking from my broken life and I'm pouring it into yours. Now I want to close with a story. Uh, this story is told of an old woman and she lived in the Far East in a little farm on the outskirts of town. And her farm was known for its beauty. She had beautiful flower gardens and beautiful flower line trails. And the birds of the air would come to her gardens and the butterflies would come and people from the village would come and they'd walk along her beautiful flower line trails. And many of them would find God as they just walked along her trails. Well, out in front of her house, she had two clay water pots that, tied, that, that were tied to either end of a long pole. And every day she'd put that pole across her shoulders and she'd go down to the river near her home and she'd fill those pots up with water, carry them back to the barn, empty them into a large clay cistern, draw water throughout the course of the day. Now, the pot that was on her right, it was a fairly new pot. It had the look and the feel and the smell of new clay. It stood there at sharp attention. Even the water it carried looked so clear and refreshing. And the pot that was on her left, it was an old pot that was modeled and chipped from having endured the storms of life. It even had a crack that went from the top down to about the halfway point. And every day when she got back to the barn and emptied the contents into the cistern, the new pot, it always had a full pot of water. But the old broken pot, the old broken pot, it never had a full pot of water. And, and the old broken pot felt really bad about this. Well, this went on for days, for weeks, for months, for years. And finally, one night, after she emptied its contents into the cistern, the old broken pot, it just couldn't take it any longer. And it spoke to the woman. And it said, Master, I'm broken and I'm so ashamed. I can never carry you a full pot of water. I see that other pot over there. It always carries you a full pot of water. Even the water it carries looks more clear and refreshing than the water I carry. I can never carry you a full pot of water because I'm broken. I am broken and I'm so ashamed. And the old woman, she looked at that pot and she said, I know. I know that you are broken. And because I know you are broken, I have planted flowers all along your side of the path. And every day, every day, you water those flowers through your brokenness. And the reason we have so many beautiful flowers on our farm, the reason the birds of the air come and the butterflies come and the reason people come and many find God, really it is because of your brokenness. Huh. 
Now listen, friends. God knows that you're broken. And He wants you to stop pretending like you're not. There's so much life that Christ has waiting for you to live on the other side of your Christian happy face. Now as we bring our time together to a close, I want to give you two opportunities to respond to this message. And I'm just going to ask you to put your hand up like this for the sake of time. That's all. Just go like that. It's painless. Just go like this. And the reason I'm going to ask you to do this is because it's an act of faith. You don't do it for me. I don't care what you do. I know where my heart is at with God. Yeah. But you do this for you. I'm giving you an invitation to demonstrate faith. The Bible requires faith to be demonstrated. And so a simple lift of the hand like this, it's a way we demonstrate faith. It's a way we put our fist in the devil's face. And we say, you're not going to get the victory in my life here. So we lift our hand in faith. That's all. Simple. So here's the first opportunity to respond. If you want God to fashion your life into the plans that he has for you, then you've got to start by having a relationship with the potter. It only makes sense, doesn't it? How else can the potter fashion their clay if they do not have a relationship with one another? How else can God fashion your life if you don't have a relationship with him? And why wouldn't you want that anyway? Why wouldn't you want that? Well, maybe you're here tonight, maybe you have it. And maybe you don't. Or maybe you just have religion. You've been going to church your whole life. But it just hasn't seemed to work for you. It seems to work for everybody else, but it doesn't work for you. It's just, you, you just, you just, it doesn't work. That's because all you've had is dead religion. Or maybe you're one of these people and you think that because you come to church that your heart is right with God. Things are right. But you know, Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, not everybody who says to me on that day, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen. You know, what day is he talking about? He's talking about the day you die. You know, we're all going to die. It's just life. We're going to die. You know, I told you I have two sisters, a little sister, older sister. A few years ago, my little sister died. Yeah, it was tragic, really sad. She was a New York City girl. We love the shop, do all this stuff. And she wasn't feeling too good. She went to the doctor, got some tests done. Then she went out shopping. She gets home to her apartment. She had an apartment there on First Avenue. She gets home to her apartment there. And she goes in the door, sees a little mastering machine, the lights blinking. Oh, I got a message. She hits the button. It was from her doctor. This was his message. Kim, 911 yourself into the hospital. That was it. How'd you like a message like that waiting for you when you get home tonight? Your doctor. 911 yourself into the hospital. Eight days later, she was dead. I was sitting with her <clears throat> a couple hours before she died. Sitting on the side of her bed, just stroking her hair. Just stroking her beautiful hair. Look at my little sister. Life was very hard for us. It was not fair. It was really hard for my little sister. When my mother left, my father and I, we just scattered. We just went in the street. We all went our separate ways. And life was hard. And here I am. You know, she grew up, she, she had a job, she worked, she loved the shop, she loved to buy shoes. She had over a hundred pair of shoes. Yeah, she only had two legs. <laughs> I, I could never figure that out. <clears throat> Why somebody need that many shoes? All these designer clothes, thousands of dollars. And do you know, here she is, two hours before she died. Not one time did she look at me and say, say, Mike, do you know all those shoes that I have? And you bring them in here, line them up for me so I can see them one more time before I go. All those clothes that I wouldn't let anybody touch or borrow, can you bring them in so I can see them one more time before I go? Huh. Friend, God made us so that we will live eternally with him. And yet we spend so much of our life working and living for things that are temporal. And I think we got it all wrong. I think we got it all wrong. And maybe you're here tonight and maybe you have some religion, but that relationship with God is the missing piece. And tonight, I want to give you the opportunity to say yes. You want that. Simple. So I'm going to ask you to close your eyes if you're comfortable. Bow your head. Because I don't want you to be distracted by your neighbor. I don't want you to be so self-conscious that you're not going to raise your hand. I don't, want, I don't want your pride to get in the way of a salvation moment. Holy Spirit, just search our hearts now. And show us, God, are we right with you? Are we right with you? Or have we missed the mark? 
And if you're, you're here and you're sitting there and you're saying, no, I've missed it. I'm, I'm not what I need to be in my relationship with God. I want to say yes. I want to ask Jesus Christ to come into my life to forgive me of my sins, the sins of commission. I want to get on back track with the Lord. Lift your hand because I want to pray for you. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. That's beautiful. That's the right thing to do. That's the right thing to do. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be ashamed. Just lift your hand. I see your hands. You can put them down. Just put them up. Put them down. Thank you so much. Okay, I want to just lead you in a simple prayer. Okay? You make these words yours. It's not the words. It's the attitude of your heart God is looking at. And you simply say, God, thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sins, of which there are many. And I ask you to please forgive me of my sins. Come into my life and be the Lord of my life now. And help me to live for you all the days of my life. Help me not to be embarrassed or ashamed to call myself a Christian. Help me not to be embarrassed or ashamed to tell my friends, my neighbors, my family, my colleagues, my classmates that I'm a Christian now. And line me up with the plans that you have for me. Show me my destiny. And help me to live it out all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. It was that simple. Friend, if you prayed that prayer, and many of you did, all of heaven is clapping for you. <clears throat> all of heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All of heaven is clapping for you. I'm really, I'm really proud of you. That was the right thing to do, and you do that for you. Now listen, if you did, if you did pray that prayer, you took the first step on a spiritual journey. It's going to change your life. But like any journey, you've got to take another step and another step, right? And this is why God has raised up pastors. And he's raised up communities of faith like this. You need to get connected to a community of faith because you need a shepherd over your life. And you need some friends in your life. Because God didn't create us to walk life out alone. He created us to walk it out in community. Because life's hard and we need each other. So I want to encourage you to get connected, okay? I want to give you one more opportunity to respond. And then I'm going to have the pastor come up and just do what pastors do. All right? All right. <laughs> Listen, as I'm making all this stuff here, talking about pressure and pain and how this pot was scarred and how, how the potter is able to take a scarred pot and turn that thing into something beautiful or, or this clay, this was the heart, the person who hardened their heart and the potter had to break them. And maybe you, you relate to that. Maybe you're thinking of a time when you had, your life was broken or maybe you're in the process now. Or you see this, this pot here. This was the person who loved God. This was the person who loved God, just like you. But you see, they had a little wound inside. Somebody did them wrong. And they, they believe that lie that if they forgive someone, they're letting them off the hook. No, the only one who gets off the hook when you forgive somebody, that's you. You get off the hook. See, the devil has, has seduced you into believing you're better off holding on to your anger. And see, you saw what happened when this person just held on to their pain, how their life came crashing down. But when they released that pain to the potter, the potter is able to, to take that pain, take a broken life and fashion it into something beautiful that can be poured out into the service of others. As you were watching all of this, maybe, just maybe, you were thinking of a time when someone hurt you. You're sitting there and you're thinking of a wound in your own soul. Listen to me, friends. <clears throat> if that was you, I really believe that this is the Holy Spirit showing you. That thing that's in your heart, that thing you were thinking about, that thing has had a stronghold in your life. That's the thing that's been holding you back. It's been preventing you from going to the next level in your relationship with God, in your relationship with other people, even in your own quality of life. It's just been, a, it's been pre preventing you from going to the next level. And God is showing it you tonight. And I want to give you an opportunity by faith to say, God, I'm going to let it go. I'm going to forgive and let it go. I'm going to stop drinking that poison. I am no longer going to give my future over to my past. And I know this is hard to do. I know it's hard to do. I struggle with it too. Because forgiveness is not natural. It's supernatural. You know what the natural thing is? When someone hurts you, you hurt them back. That's a natural thing, right? The saying goes, hurt people hurt people. Forgiveness isn't a natural process. It's a supernatural process. And you can't perform a supernatural process with natural ability. That's why it hasn't worked for you in the past. But if you have Jesus Christ in your life... You can do it. The Spirit of God will give you the strength by faith to break that stronghold and say, I'm going to give it to you, God. And I'm going to ask you, if that's you, 
Lift your hand toward heaven in open hand, just, to, just as a symbolic gesture that you're letting it go and giving it to the Lord. If that's you tonight, come on church, lift your hand and say, I'm going to let it go. I'm no longer going to give my future over to my past. Jesus, take this pain from me. I'm tired of carrying it. I don't want it to rob me anymore. I'm going give to give it to you. I'm so proud of you, church. I am so proud of you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let's let it go, church. Let's give it up to the Lord right now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God in the highest. Praise the Lord forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father in heaven, God, your word says without faith, it's impossible to please you. That means impossible. You are not impressed with how many times we come to church. You're not impressed with how much we read our Bible. You're not impressed with how talented we are. What impresses you is a humble heart. A heart that says, God, I can't do this on my own. I need you. And by faith, so many this evening have lifted their hand toward heaven. And in so doing, declaring, they're going to let that thing go. God, on the authority of the empty tomb now, I just command any strength stronghold that's been over their life because of the sins that others have committed against them that that stronghold is broken in the name of Jesus hallelujah oh God I pray that you would be Jehovah Rapha tonight and be the God who heals you be Jehovah Shalom you be the God of peace you just fill each heart here fill each mind here with your peace oh God and let the Spirit of God who raised Christ from the dead now dwell in them. And let it quicken their mortal bodies that they might live a transcendent life. And I pray that the banner over their life now is free indeed. Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Hey, come on church. Say that with me. Say, free indeed. Come on church. Let's say it again. Free indeed. Hallelujah. Give it up for the Lord. Glory to God. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Yeah. Now listen, church. You walk in that. You walk in that. Walk in that victory. Walk in that victory. Listen, I'll tell you something. That I, this, I wasn't going to plan to say this. It came to my head. Listen. <clears throat> A psychologist, sociologist, anthropologist, they study uh, cultures. They study people all around the world. And they've, they identify like seven basic emotions, universal emotions. Every human being has them in every culture, right? Um, emotions like anger, uh, sorrow, uh, these things. Well, a, a universal emotion is shame. Shame is a universal emotion. Every human being feels that, right? Now, shame is different than guilt. Guilt says what I did is bad. Shame says who I am is bad. Okay? Shame has to do with a sense of self. Now, a universal human behavior for shame is we cover our face. That's a universal behavior. So mommy and daddy, you got your little kids, you start yelling at your little kid there because they did something wrong. If they're looking at you and their little lips are trembling and those tears are coming down their eyes, that's okay. They're feeling guilt. What they did was bad. But if, if they ever start going like this, put their head down or they go like this, or they don't want to look at you, they're covering their face, that's a sign for shame. You took that discipline too far. What you're doing, you're not telling your child what they did is bad, you're telling them who they are is bad. See, they cover their face. So you got to turn that thing around. See, and you do that with your words. You speak life into them. You say, no, no, you're good. You're good, Junior. You, what you did wasn't good, but you are good. You, you speak that into them. Now listen, <clears throat> all of us, when we have shame, we lower our head. We cover our face. But do you know what it says? I think it's Psalm 3. You know what it says? It says that God is the, the glory and the one who lifts up my head. He lifts us up out of our shame. Hallelujah. Now listen, friend, you got Jesus in your life. He's lifting you out of that shame. It's one thing to know that you're forgiven. It's another thing, thing to live your life like you're forgiven. And I want to encourage you, you walk out of here with your head held up high. You walk out of here with your head held up high. Not arrogant, not arrogant, prideful. Not No, you be humble, but you lift your head up high because there's no more shame. Okay? God's going to heal you. He loves you. Pastor, come on up here and do something pastor-like. Come on. <laughs>